Good morning, everyone. So a little bit of um, insight before I call on stage my f the speakers as of why we wanted to do this. Well, during all the session yesterday, a lot was discussed about data standardization, what's the next step, but we all realized that quality is the next step. Like when, as soon as we have standards, as soon as we uh, produce data that is standardized, then we need to make sure that it is of high quality. I think that's one of the core reason of all of us being here today. We want to make sure that the data out there for travelers is standardized, shared, but first and foremost of good quality. So people don't get lost. People can actually enjoy uh, going from A to B seamlessly. And I'm pretty sure that all of you discussed amazing ways of doing this better, but we wanted to take a step back and I need to thank Katie in the room from Transit for suggesting this three months ago almost, is how about we give insight to the room of what happened when the data is of bad quality? And how about we get on stage everyone who actually can share with you what happened when data producers give data set that are not necessarily as good as it would be expected. So for this, all the presentation and our speakers, I would like to call on stage for this very first session of us putting these amazing people together. I would like uh, so to welcome very warmly, Elizabeth Sol, representative Cal ITP. Brian Ferris, representing Google. Mike Fosker, representing Ito World. Tome Osterhoff, representing Move It. And Guillaume Campagna, representing Transit. They all promise they will play nice to each other and not kill each other on stage, but feel free to ask them very uncomfortable questions. <laughs> Before we start, let's introduce a little bit of speakers. Guillaume, for the one who haven't met him yesterday, is the proud co-founder and CTO of Transit. He is based here in the lovely city of Montréal, Quebec, Canada. And you can reach out to him in French and English. And before he actually created Transit App that was founded in 2009, if I'm correct, um, he has years and years of experience in mobile app development. And he grew from an iOS developer to being the amazing technical uh, chief of te uh, chief technical officer of Transit. We will then hear from Brian, who is a software engineer at Google. He is based in Seattle, Washington. He holds a PhD in computer science, and you can reach out to him in English. Um, and he has been working on urban mobility features at Google Maps for over. A decade. Prior to Google, he founded the open source Open Bus Away project. And this day, his most pressing problem is actually how can I fit more bikes into my garage? <laughs> we will also hear from Mike Fosker, product manager at Ito World. He is based in Manwon Smith, I guess, um, Great Britain. <laughs> Sorry if I mispronounced this one. <laughs> he is a certified Scrum product owner and he is also a graphic designer. He has over 20 years of professional experience managing multi-team project and international software rollout. He has worked for companies such as Nokia and CrowdFunder, and he also developed Android and Windows version of the popular app Book Creator. 
You will hear from Tomer. I think we have introduced him a lot on stage lately. Thank you for joining us all the way from Israel. He's the head of operations at MoveIt. And he is actually in charge of managing MoveIt's global data operation community and support teams, which validate, sort, correct, and integrate data from a wide range of sources, including the crowd, um, and type of data into the world's largest transit database constantly. And Elizabeth Soul, that most of you actually know, she is, uh, I, as it was reflected, one of the pioneers of why we are all here today for this summit and at Mobility Data. And she is a principal at uh, Urban Labs and also the Mobility Service Data Lead for CalITP. She's based in Seattle, Washington, USA. She has a Master of Science in Engineering from Civil Engineering from the University of Texas at Austin. You can reach out in English and a little bit in French. And she has dedicated the majority of her life to trying to make the world a better place for more people and spent the balance of her life enjoying it. Now, let's hear from Guillaume first. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, two things. Um, first of all, a, a quite a small deep down, uh, dive down into GBFS. We did a report recently on the feed quality that we see in the G GBFS ecosystem. So GBFS, even if it, uh, for those who aren't aware, is the shared mobility standard out there. So we looked at uh, what we thought would make a great GBFS feed. And we look at four items um, that, uh, that, that makes it a great or bad G GBFS feed. So first of all, discoverability. So you need to be able to actually find the feed. Reliability, if, if it if it's available or not, uh, the quality of the feed, and the freedom of use in the licensing. Um, so one important aspect uh, of being able to use a GBFS feed is to be able to use it. So around 70% 70, 70 of the cities in North America now require a GBFS feed um, to be open for their op uh, shared mobility systems. However, we don't want the GBFS feed to just be a checkbox, right? We want to be able to actually be able to use it and be of high quality. So the first thing to be able to do that is the availability in the GitHub repository. Uh, the GBFS GitHub repository contains a list, a CSV of the systems out there. And you can see um, pretty obviously some operators have a good track record of being able to share back that, uh, that systems. So spin, lift, and link uh, have the higher percentage of their feeds being actually uh, available in the system CSV in the GitHub repository. And some other operators are not doing, not doing as great, so they don't have that same, um, that same requirement internally. And one also very important aspect of discoverability uh, is actually being able to use that feed uh, without any authentication keys or, uh, or login. So we want, we want GBFS feed to be open, and uh, VO ride is actually not, uh, is actually requiring an authentication key, keys to get the GBFS feed. Um, so that forces the user to contact the operator, request permission, and it goes against the spirit of open data. Um, one very important aspect of a feed quality is the uptime. So when a feed is down, uh, so it's not available for apps to be able to show their the service in the app. Uh, it creates a very bad experience for the user, and, and, and it also reflects on the operator and and the consumer apps. Uh, when we did our our checks, that was at the end of April. Uh, so we had some feeds that had below ninety percent uptime, which is fairly bad. That means like ten percent of the time you would open, for example, transit, and you would not see the a GBFS feed inside the app. Um, so that, that's a fairly big um, inconvenience. Um, however, we s Link contacted us since the publication of a report. And now, um, now they fixed uh, most of the problems. And we can also confirm that uh, we are back into the excellent category of 99.9 .9 uptime 
plus. Um, also, Spin is telling us that they have improvements coming soon. Um, the problems were mainly due to rate limiting. Um, also, one very important um, way of uh, keeping quality in a feed is get, uh, getting up to speed into the latest GTFS version. Um, so most actually most scooters operators are uh, getting um, are, are using the latest GTFS GBFS version. But there are some uh, operators like Clift, PBSC, and Bcycle that still doesn't, and they are using a modified version of GBFS because GBFS, sorry, of GBFS 1.0, because GBFS 1.0 didn't include all the capabilities they needed, and then, so they do modify it to be able to do everything that they, they can, they, they need to do, even if just using the latest version would achieve those results. And as share mobility becomes more and more complex, um, using the latest version of GBFS is increasingly important. And lastly, uh, the freedom of use. So the the licensing terms be able to use the GBFS. Some um, some operators require uh, to the information to be displayed in real time only, and disallow any type of data storage or analysis on uh, on the data, which um, restricts some of the uses that can be very interesting in, for a GBFS feed. Um, so that's the case of Lime and Bird, uh, but others like Spin and, and Lyft are and uh, are less restrictive. Um, so what operators can actually do, um, so we have a list here, which is basically the list of the things I talked about, so strive for high uptime, um, update to the latest version of GBFS, of all the GBFS posted in the GitHub repository, and don't use authentication keys if you can avoid it, and also uh, make sure that the licensing terms are um, open, uh, as open as possible. Um, we have a report on the website if you want to see more information about it. Um, uh, it. It contains all the information I talked about and more. That's on GBFS. Um, I'll do a tiny, tiny part on GTFS. One very important aspect that uh, we think of, uh, of uh, GTFS or transit data. And so that's my or screen. Um, I opened the app. I mean, uh, downtown Montreal, and there's no nearby line. So obviously there's transit systems around here. Um, so if I see this, I'm panicking because that means we don't have any s data for the STM, we don't have any data for um, EXO trains and EXO buses. Um, so that's certain, certainly not something that we want to happen. And it happens in transit when we don't have any valid data to show. And so the c most common reason for that um, happening is last-minute GTFS publication or GTFS publication with gaps, so where there's uh, valid data one day and not the other and, and can go back and forth. And also uh, with GTFS publication with limit time, limited time validity. So we see sometimes operators um, creating um, uh, GTFS feeds that are valid for 24 to 48 hours, which is obviously very, very short. And why is that actually causing problems on our side? So GTFS can take, can take time to process. Um, we take between uh, a, a couple dozen minutes to a couple hours to process a GTFS feed. And other uh, consumers all, uh, can also take more time to process those feeds. Um, so when processing those feeds, that means that during that time, um, um, the, the error is still on. If there's an error, the error is still ongoing in the app. And also there can be error, error processing the new feed. And when we talk about errors, that may be very validity checks. So it may be an actual error in the GTFS that we find and that we just can't process it. Or something, sometimes it's in, in our cases, might be something that needs val manual validation. So we need a human to actually look at it because we think it's, it doesn't look right, but it might be right. So we want to make sure that uh, it is correct. And so if we have uh, um, a very short uh, GTFS, um, and there's an error in the processing, we don't have any time to react. We don't have any time to actually some, some, someone to have, be able to look at it or be able to con uh, contact the, the, con the producer and, and work together to fix the issue. Um, so if, if we can avoid it, that's what we want to do. And how can we avoid it? So provide the GTFS feed as soon as it's available. So if we have a GTFS feed 
that's valid in a couple of months or a couple of weeks or a couple of days, do it as soon as possible, we'll be able to integrate it um, uh, and make sure that there's no errors before it's too late. Um, also provide at least seven days of the valid data in your GTFS. So a week is, is a good benchmark of how many, time, uh, how many time it would be the minimum, um, but of course, longer is better. Um, and lastly, if you do need to make last minute change, because we understand that sometimes that's unavoidable, um, contact your favorite data consumers um, and, or the data consumer that you work with uh, closely um, so, so that we can expedite um, the changes uh, and make sure that there's no um, big consequences in the app. In our case, um, um, anyone can send requests or, uh, or questions or information at data at transit.app for data inquiries. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Guillaume. I believe now it's time to hear from Brian. Another consumer point of view. We'll see if you can hear me, yes. I, there's a lot I could say about transit data quality and while it matters, and I think you probably heard a lot of it here already before. Uh, but I want to give some motivating examples from my own life and from the billions of users we see over on Google Maps of why this stuff matters. Uh, you know, selfishly, a lot of the things I've done in transit have been selfish in that I ride transit a lot. And I love it when it works well for me. I uh, happen to be lucky enough to be in Vancouver last weekend with my family, waiting for a bus that turned out it was not going to come because of a protest happening downtown or a march. And you know, I think we've all been in those situations where what we see on our app isn't reflecting what's happening in the reality. Um, and trying to explain to my seven-year-old, why isn't this bus coming? You said it was going to be here 10 minutes ago, and dad, you're never wrong, which she didn't actually say that because she <laughs> said that all the time. But, and you know, me looking at the tea leaves of the CAD AVL system trying to figure out if this thing was going to come at all. Um, unfortunately, it did, and we made it to where we were going. But uh, it's a hard moment, and those are the moments we win and lose when it comes to getting people on transit or having them go catch the Uber or just have taken their car in the first place. So we've touched on some of these already on stage, and we've touched a lot on these this week. Uh, our users at Google and users of transit systems everywhere uh, face a lot of the same issues when it comes to data quality. And this is a non-exhaustive list, but kind of representative of the sort of things that people face. You know, when we try to direct you to a stop that's in the wrong location and you don't know where to go. Trip names and route names that don't match what's on official signage or on the bus head sign that make it really hard to know, like, am I headed in the right direction? Is this really the train I need to get on? Uh, we deal with a lot of feeds where entire routes or trips are just dropped from a feed and they're just not there. And it might not be the entire feed that's bad, it might just be some small part, but if you're the user who is waiting for that route, it can be pretty frustrating. Yami you know, touched a lot on expiring feeds. Uh, we spend a lot of time working on this, feeds that we don't get an update or the update is bad and a lot of work, both manual and automatic. Um, there's a whole host of issues, real-time information of things that can go wrong that when real time works well, it's amazing. It gives you a lot of confidence in the system. It gives you um, the ability to trust what's happening and know that you're not just waiting there in the void. Um, but when it goes wrong, you can get burned and feel, it feels pretty terrible. Um, and so I, I could go on. Uh, this is, and this is, of course, not excusing any of the issues that might be with our own systems. We, we create our own bugs sometimes. But the data quality does matter, and it's reflected by what we see from our users. Uh, and you know, we've, we talk a lot about mode switching and getting people out of cars and into buses and trains and public transit and, and other shared mobility modes. And these are the sort of like the trench battles where we win and lose those users on these small details when they go out looking, trying out something, and when it doesn't quite work, uh, that can erase you know like a whole you know months of success with transit, and they get frustrated and they're like, oh, I'm just going to go back to the thing that I know that I can control. So, you know, if nothing else, I, I don't, well, I, wanna, I would make that case for why this details matter, but I think you probably already all are on board with that. I don't think I have to spend a lot of time on that. So I'm gonna talk a little bit briefly today about what Google does in these situations, and then also sort of the call to action, I think, of what we can do as a community, and I think we'll get into more on that in the questions phase. So um, how we identify issues is probably not that much different than some of the other consumers in this space, different flavors of things. Uh, User reports, as you see, top of the list. You know, the eyes on the ground of the people using our systems and our, our tools are very important for giving us details about 
where things are working well, but more importantly, where they're not. Um, but that's not exhaustive. We know there's plenty of users who, instead of like sending a helpful report, or, you know, sending a report when things go bad, just close the app and we never hear about it. Uh, so we do a lot of work around automated anomaly detection across a variety of uh, domains of detecting not just that a feed's expired, but that one particular small part of this huge multi-agency feed has expired and we need to go figure out what's going on there or that a router line was dropped or that we used to see a lot of users using a bus stop here and now we don't and that's a little suspicious what's going on there. Um, so there's a lot of what we try to do with an automated fashion because we have, you know, when you're working coverage over the entire world, like that's the only thing that can really scale. But at the same time, uh, we do have human operators in the loop who are looking at this stuff and evaluating what's working, what looks good from a quality standpoint, what needs to be improved, what can we do to reach out. Um, and we also, you know, rely a lot on validation tools. We've integrated the open source GTFS schedule validator uh, for mobility data, and we're always working on more tools in that space to sort of catch things earlier on in the process. So the question is, you know, when you have an issue, what happens? Um, in an ideal world, you report that upstream to the data producer. They produce a fix in a timely manner, and life's great. Uh, but I think we all know that that may not, not always the case, and maybe not even the majority of the time. Sometimes those issues are complex, and even when an agency or producer wants to make an improvement, they just can't either due to technical or resource limitations. Uh, so we have a fair amount of infrastructure in-house that we use for making edits and fixes to data on our own. Um, this could be you know, UGC where users report something and we can fix a, you know, a stop location to much more, uh, I would say, dramatic you know, changes to feeds where we restructure entirely to reflect what we actually think we see on the ground, adding entire routes, lines, missing schedules. Um, I think. I, we've talked a little bit this week about how in some parts of the world there just isn't scheduled data to be had or you know there's no agency producing GTFS and we have to go you know make that happen from the real world data that we can get our hands on. But uh, that's an expensive uh, proposition for us. Uh, it's work that we think is essential because we do think you know this is important to our users. Um, but I'll, I'll, be, I'll be frank, there's lots of work I'd rather be doing. Um, lots of new features I'd like to be building for our users new capabilities, new things we'd like to focus on. Um, we think da base data quality is just table stakes at this point. It's, it's an assumption that it's there. This is not a nice to have. This is a necessary thing. So there's a lot we could do about that. Um, what do we do to support better data quality at sale? Um, and I think for me, it starts with supporting the efforts of mobility data. Uh, we're big believers in that. You know, the improvements to the data specs, the open source canonical validation tools, and all the sort of best practices around quality. Uh, I think, you know, we as a community for a, you know a long time, we were you know Google especially did doing our own thing. We have our own sort of things we're willing to take when it comes to data. Things that you know, things we, we expected data in ways that maybe wasn't exactly aligned with everybody else. I think that makes it hard for data producers to know what to produce. You know, should I be giving data that's ideal for this system or this other system? Uh, I think we all know that there's plenty of work we can do on trying to make this stuff easier for the producers to know like what what is basic data look like what is quality data look like establishing those best practices and then the real question is you know what do we do as a community about that and i think coming together in forums like this to build consensus on sort of what the challenges and opportunities are is a great start because i think we're all facing a lot of the same issues in the space uh, and i think we're all fighting the same battles and i think there's some opportunity to sort of combine our efforts in the space so that we can leverage it, you know, there's limits of what any one of us can do to go convince a different, a given producer that, hey, this is you know something you should go fix in your feed. I think when that message comes from a unified community, where we're all in agreement, like this is what quality looks like, and this is an expectation, and this is not just Google asking, this is everybody asking. I, th I think hopefully we can leverage that to sort of make some larger changes for all the producers in this space. Um, that's not an easy thing to do, um, and I'm happy to get into some of the details, hopefully, in the questions, but uh, I think that's the opportunity here, so I look forward to seeing what we can do. Thanks. Thank you, Brian. And in the effort of improving quali the quality of data, we will hear from Mike, uh, representing Ito World, who actually do a lot to help improve the data quality. Am I on? I'm on, okay. Hi, 
Um, at Tito World, we make tools for managing and making sense of transit data for cities and for transit agencies. And we've also been working to enhance transit data for journey planners and other data consumers for, for around 10 years. And as Brian said, I'm, I'm certain that everyone here can agree that high quality data about the transit network improves the, uh, the experience of the passenger and makes it more likely that they will try and can continue to use public transit. The rider needs to have the confidence that the information that they access accurately describes how the transit network is going to work so they can plan their travel. And they also expect that when the schedules and the services change, that this information is communicated in a timely manner. And we often refer to this as the data being as close to the ground truth as possible. The information needs of the rider vary depending on their context. Enabling riders to plan their journey in advance requires good advanced coverage of the network and of upcoming schedules. Lower coverage of the future schedules or of missing services result in poor or no journey options being presented to them. Providing up-to-date rider information on the street requires that that data be consistent with their other sources of information. Updates have to be timely and they need to reflect the ground truth of what's happening right now. Good coverage of journeys in the future is less important here, but knowing which buses are coming now is very important. And ensuring that that information is concise, it's intelligible and it fits on the sign helps communicate that important information clearly. Accurate predictions of the bus arrival time, consistent across apps and signage, tell us when the bus is coming. And then the line name, the branding, the colors, help us pick out which is the right vehicle to get on. And once on the bus, accurate shape information helps to, helps to see where your location is in relation to the destination. And that interim stop information combined with the on-vehicle signage lets me know where I need to get off. Errors in this data can affect the rider in many different contexts. And every time that a rider is confused or let down, this reduces their satisfaction and trust in the transit system and their inclination to use it again. Let down frequently enough, some riders will choose other modes, hopefully cycling or micromobility, but often a car. And riders who have no other option will continue to ride, but they'll have to allow more contingency add more to their perceived journey time and reduce their satisfaction overall. Gross errors with timing can cause riders to wait excessively or worse, they can arrive at the stop after their bus has departed. So we find ourselves adjusting the timings of stops in between timing points where this data suggests that the bus would be traveling excessively quickly or impossibly slowly. Occasionally these timings are completely wrong and we have to refer to other sources to find the correct schedule. Basic head sign data for circular and loop services often doesn't describe where the vehicle is actually going, other than where the last stop is, which is not super helpful if that's already where you are. And we add in stop level head signs to reflect those interim stops or points of interest along that route. Schedule updates from some agencies often arrive just as the previous data set expires, making future journey planning next to impossible. Many times this future schedule is very similar to the current one and we can extend the current schedule into the future until the new one arrives. But we have to be careful not to replicate holiday services or other short-term service changes. And sometimes we see data for multiple variants of a route combined into a single route. And this makes it very hard to differentiate the right vehicle to catch. In some cases we can split that data out into separate routes so that journey planners can present it more clearly, but on other occasions, doing something like that totally messes up the matching to the real-time data. So we, in, we manage this by enriching the head signs to provide more information about the via stops and the, the destinations of the different routes. So when we're assessing the data for a city and planning where to devote our effort and our time, we look at a few different dimensions of quality. And these primarily come under completeness, accuracy, and richness. So under completeness, we're looking at coverage of the routes and are all those modes and routes for a city present so the rider can be given the most appropriate journey information across the city. Is that data fresh? Is it updated frequently? So frequently that we can expect that planned disruptions and suspensions would have been taken into account. And does it have good look ahead? Does the data describe the services well into the future? Under accuracy, we're looking at how well it describes the real world. The stop locations are accurate. Are they on the right side of the street? Is the duplication of stops, routes, trips, or other information? And where we're combining multiple data, source, data sources together to make up a city, can we reliably use one of those as the most accurate source and merge or discard those that overlap? And we look to see that the agency and route branding is present with the names, the colors that reflect the vehicles and the signage. And of course, we want to see that the timings are realistic. And we also like to see whether holiday and other non-standard schedules are well, well represented. 
And under richness, we're looking at some of those optional elements, but very important things like accessibility for stops and vehicles, pathways and entrances for stations, and shapes data that's consistent with the actual layout of the stops and the underlying road network. And for head signs, we're looking for clear and unambiguous information that's well and consistently formatted and that handles circular services and loops well and reflect the ground truth of the journey. Validators and warning systems can help tell us about the data which is invalid, which is missing, or which is unlikely to be correct. And they can point us to duplications in our data, inconsistencies and formatting issues. In many cases, though, assessing the accuracy of the data requires familiarity with the transit system and comparison to other data sources. Establishing shared definitions of data quality, such as the GTFS grading system, enables discussion between producers and consumers and provides a common reference point for addressing issues. The improved passenger experience benefits data producers and consumers alike. There are agencies and cities that have the capacity, as well as the capability, to, en to, do to enrich the data they produce. And equally, there are many that are unable or do not have the capacity for this. And so in many cases, the consumers are the ones who have the incentives to enhance the source data to suit their needs. And this can be expensive and laborious, as Brian said, and often leads to a duplication of effort by consumers and inconsistencies between providers. In other cases, such as in the UK, legislation puts more of the onus on the data producer to make their data available, to meet certain standards and to respond to issues that are raised. And this remains to be seen yet whether this will result in a longer term, higher quality data output. Irrespective of who should be responsible, working towards common standards for quality not only enables dialogue about improving data, but also provides a clearer link between the actions that can be taken and the resulting improvements for the rider. It's in everyone's interest to improve the rider experience and thereby increase ridership. Not so long ago, SatNav was for cars, and maybe I'm going to show my age a little bit here, but planning and booking public transit journeys involved paper timetables and phone lines and a lot of patience. And digital information about services, where it was available, was in a range of complex and very proprietary formats. And over the last decade and a half, unseen, unseen by people like me and maybe the general riding public, there's been an explosion, a proliferation of data in uh, standardized formats that's led to an in lots of innovation and new applications for riders. It's much easier to plan, book and ride and pay for public transport than it's ever been. And in many cities in the world, I can pull out my phone, I can use it to plan my trip, I can book my ticket and I can pay for my ride. And people who would not have considered public transport in the past now have these options right there in the same apps that they would have used to plan their car journey. And this is all down to all of you and the people on this stage. And if I wasn't holding the mic, maybe I'd applaud you. <laughs> but there's still a lot of work to do. Creating and maintaining and publishing the high quality transit information is still a challenge for many agencies. As the data becomes more sophisticated, the problems of maintaining it become more complex and the information about accessible services is still sadly very inconsistent. New modes and business models such as micromobility and the ride hailing present new challenges for integrating data and providing a joined up experience for the public. And rich, accurately, high quality transit information exists for some cities and countries, but not for the majority. And that's why collaboration across our industry and events such as these is so important. Improving the passenger experience requires us all to work together, to learn from each other's challenges, share best practice, and reach a common understanding on what good looks like whether that's best practices for how we structure and format the data, agreed standards for how we measure quality, international efforts to standardize on things like shared identifiers, or approaches for crowdsourcing and sharing open data, or tools to make the creation, validation, and enhancement of high quality data more accessible. The more consistent and reliable that our data becomes, the more cities and modes that are covered, and the more riders can come to rely on and incorporate transit into their life. Thank you, Mike. Now let's give the floor to Thomas from MoveIt, and he will talk also about how they work on improving quality and not only using the crowd. All right. Um, I just want to start with that I cannot emphasize stronger how I hear my colleagues here on stage, and I just want to nod and say, yes, they're super right. Please listen to them. So I, I, I just said it. And I want to take you um, to 
very similar things that we just heard here and maybe to show you a bit how much effort and energy is invested um, in making the, da the data better, right? So the tree planning, the tree planner is the key. That's what we want to provide that is close, the, the closest to reality. We have several sources and inputs to that. I'm going to focus today on the official data one, on the GTFS side. Uh, but of course, many, many, many others uh, we can have a dedicated session about. The way we um, handle it, probably similar to everybody here, we compile, then we validate, modify, and enhancing the data or enrichment has been said um, to every one of our sources and GTFSs. When uh, we started, of course, we, our approach, and still is, uh, that provide us any data that you have, we will make it happen and we'll implement it in the app. So, so many sources are not even GTFS formatted um, or any of the parallels. There's a lot of, I can throw many names right here, but even PDFs, or an Excel file, or even a description of, um, I have a very nice story of one of the main Indian uh, agencies that we send our operation manager and they said, yes, we have all the schedule here and they show him a huge book of really thin paper with all the schedules and it, there's many, many things out there. We all, uh, we take all and compile it to a GTFS. This is a, a different struggle, right? So we want to start with the same format. And of course, we have the community data that starts as a GTFS, and of course, we don't have validation issues there. So once we get a, a GTFS and a official data, we validate. And we also, as everybody's here, needed to enhance the, the validator tool um, that uh, uh, we will know exactly the nature of the source. Now, we have more than a thousand GTFS issues a week. Uh, out of them, 200 are not even, we're not able to, to load uh, no matter what we want. We must have the, the agency's support for it uh, because we don't know the reality. Um, and this is every week. Now, when, when you validate a GTFS, it's not enough to understand if it's in the format or, and, and there's a lot of issues of supersonic buses, right? And we know all the validation lines, but it has a context. It's part of a global system. It has a past and it has a future. And you need to understand that because once you get into that point, you need to manipulate it. And it happens all the time you need to know the, the nature of that into the whole public transportation system because the tree plan is multimodal. It's part, the GTFS is part of the, the, the trip of the user. So you must, and this is something that we do all the time, you must look, as you can see here, a trip matrix, right? With the holidays, or if there's a corona situation, or uh, compared to that uh, day at the same time, the past seven days, past seven weeks, well, you need to understand the nature of the GTFS and validate the core, even if it's valid, okay, uh, according to the format. So the context of, of the GTFS is super critical and sometimes it does, just doesn't, doesn't make sense. Stops, let's talk a bit about stops, right? Uh, super critical to know where your stop is. So um, there's a, a, an automatic way. This is an automatic way because the, the manual time we need to invest in it is just, just not doable. Um, we, we had a patent that um, you can see here and, and let me uh, maybe jump to a more clear example. This is a queen in this example, right? It's, something you wouldn't expect, but by aggregating the people movement and when they, they uh, take the bus, you can understand where the stop is um, in an automatic way. Uh, here you can see a very, very clear example of 100 meters difference. There's more than 20% of the stops in our data repository that are not accurate in more than 15 meters and more in around 5% that more than 100 meters. 
it's a lot of stops. And this is things that shouldn't change much, right? So first, know where the stop is because the tree, everything counts on it. Then um, stop sequence and stops on the wrong side. You'll be surprised to know how many stops have been added and removed every GTFS updated. You are not sure where they are, what they were before. They're not on the right location. Um, so we do have a, a system that, that notify, and this is partly it's semi-automatic. And you need to go stop by stop and to see exactly if not in the middle of the street, right? Or this kind of, of accuracy is super critical when talking about meters. Then once you have all the stops in place, you want to check the trip a, a shape, right? Where it actually traveled. This is very important because if it's going too fast or too slow or it doesn't make sense where it goes, it affects a lot of other implementation later on. So we look, of course, also in OSM and also with GPS, if accurate enough. Um, we also have our crowdsourcing that can map on the go, but eventually we get the same results. We see here an example, and then you change the shapes. Now we eventually change the shapes in more than 90% of the shapes worldwide. Uh, because sometimes even if it's on the road, it's not accurate, it's not smooth, it's, I don't know, crossing the middle of a roundabout and so and so. Um, it's generated almost automatically to all the shapes. Pathways. Getting lost in a central station or missing your bus because it's 20 meters of you and you're waiting on the uh, wrong uh, platform can be super frustrating. And um, there's around only 100 agencies that are actually publishing those correctly. So we need to fix more than 1,000 uh, agencies every time. Now, luckily, it doesn't change frequently. But uh, things do change. And the information of accessibility for sure or the time it takes it's super, critical. it's super critical because you can, and it happened to me in New York that I entered an entrance, I uh, passed my ticket, I then realized after that I lost the $275 to the metro, to the subway, since it wasn't the head sign and direction I needed. So there's a lot of complexity also in that, you know, not only localization of exactly the name of the exit or the entrance, but if I can use it, maybe it's closing those hours and the correct head sign. A bit about fares. Um, we have fares V1, fares V2, right? A, a bit of numbers. Uh, we realized four years ago, it's very, very, very critical to the user to know exactly the price they will pay for the whole trip plan, for the whole trip, not only for that bus and then separately for that bus. Uh, fares V1, has now around 871 agencies globally that provide it. I'm not talking about if it's accurate enough yet, but it's been provided in 870. V2, less than 60. Um, and four years ago, the numbers were, this is the current uh, state, and four years ago, it was almost none. And we had the need. So we were forced to create our own a solution and in this solution we took into consideration as we took in the validation a GTFS file has the limitations it has it's part of a global system it's great that it has maybe the fares but there are so many rules that you cannot format it or not format it in, in, the, in the GTFS even in the V2 and more rules that are between agencies and between GTFSs that make sense. We all we are aware. Uh, the first big project we had in London, I don't know how much time we invested in it since I prefer not to know and realize uh, the effort it was. You can build a small company doing it. Okay, it's it's amazing. I we we don't really understand why the calculation need to be that complex, but. 
Uh, that's why we needed to find our own solution. And there can be a specific entrance in a specific uh, central station that if you take the connection from there, then you get a discount or by mileage uh, with incremental steps. And then if it's uh, um, according to the shape or uh, air distance, so many things you need to have ability to control, right? And um, we, we, from those number of agencies, now we have more than 400 cities. We have that MTFS, we call it, it's the move it solution. But eventually it's to provide the correct number at the bottom because the, the user doesn't care usually about everything. He wants to know the bottom line since he makes the decision, right? So this is another thing we had to crowdsource, right? There are no solution. We contact all the agencies. They have their own information, uh, maybe not in books like uh, the story of India. But finally, uh, is it, it exists. And you just need to put it all together. A word about crowd, uh, crowdedness. Uh, also here, not many live feeds. Uh, for for person uh, counter uh, on the buses, so we needed to compensate uh, as many are doing, especially in Corona era. Um, and this is another thing I think we discussed it, so I will uh, switch fast to short term change. And this is another thing that uh, um, Mike also mentioned. There are things that are changing frequently every time. Only and uh, I'm. Going back to London because, as you see, I have some nightmares from from London. But um, there's more than 100,000 changes a week only in Greater London that are not when they happen. They are not in the GTFS and TFL and other agencies in London have great data, but uh, you need to change it yourself. And then what happens when a new GTFS uh, comes in? Right? Does it include everything or not? You need to run it again. And it goes with you all the time, and then the changes are expanded. And so, so this is something you need to do. It's semi-automatic. Um, it's not everybody uses the same format. If they have alerts, no, not every agency has a feed for alerts and so on. You can understand the complexity of it. Let's talk about timetables, because um, let's assume you don't have real time, or the real time is not good which is majority of the world. The timetable is very, very, very critical. Um, and we adjust many of it. Uh, this is an example, and you will see it's not a unique example at all of a line that starts in the morning. On the X axis, you see the stop sequence stops number one until the uh, 30. And on the Y axis, you see the day, the hour of the day. You see that uh, the, the bottom line, the gray line, is the GTFS uh, time to the stop. But the blue line is the ATA, it's the actual time of arrival. And there's more than 30 minutes a uh, gap once the rush hour starts, right? 7.20, something like that, in that case. Now, think about that reality. And more than that, it's not a unique case. You can see here the percentage. We want, of course, everybody ideally wants to be at exactly the time, maybe one minute here, one minute there. It makes sense. Things happen. So this is where I marked maybe where we want to, to go. But you will see that according to the time of the day, there's even in the, I think, the PM peak, more than 50% are late more than 10 minutes of the trips. This is crazy. Um, and eventually, if you don't have a good real time, and even if you have and it says 30 minutes delay, it's not a trip you that you're taking, right? So you need a trip planner that is based on real time and not static data. And this is another thing that in some of the places we can offer, or statistical GTFS that takes into account really the ATA, but you need to have good GPS data for it, right? You cannot do it everywhere, although we wish. And then you can provide it maybe to uh, the agency to fix their GTFS. 
So this is a true issue that even if the GGFS is, so, is valid, is great, everything fits, even the agency websites, you pick up the phone, you call them, they say, yes, this is exactly the time. It has nothing to do with reality. A bit of uh, how I would like uh, things to go forward um, from my side is first, every GTFS that is being generated, validate it. Um, I know it sounds obvious, it doesn't happen. Um, as I said, we have more than 200 that are so not valid, we cannot even fix it. Then, not only have a GTFS a, a dur durance of, of seven days, like suggested here, but publish it early, at least a, a week before, even if it's not completed and there will be more version of it for the, the same reason of giving us the ability to provide you feedback. Since once you release last minute GTFS, even if I want to provide you feedback, I have to handle it on my own, right? So I don't have time and a buffer at all. So we want to uh, give support, but we need the time for it. And then if you have a GTFS RT or service related solution available, or it's in your roadmap, or this is a crucial key since it's compensated a lot of the issues of the GTFS. Um, so please um, consider this in your roadmap. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas. And we would like now to hear from Elizabeth, who will actually tell us how to help producers, because here we have heard a lot about consumers saying that the quality is not good enough and it costs them a lot. Thank you. Um, it's great to be here. I also want to recognize that I'm not a data producer. Um, so um, if there's any data producers in the, the room that would like to override me, feel free. I don't uh, claim to speak on behalf of them so much as represent what I've heard from them. So what is CalITP and what am I doing here? Um, you can read the description, the official description, but essentially um, our mandate is to make um, riding transit as smooth and easy as ordering an Uber or Lyft, uh, make it as easy to pay for as buying a cup of coffee, um, and make sure that we're not leaving people behind in that process and that we're bringing the people um, along with us who most we must want to pay attention to. Um, and there's a lot of people in this room who touch and work for Cal ITP or have worked in the past uh, <laughs> and maybe got uh, sucked into the, the black hole of talent that MBTA is these days. Um, so, <laughs> um, <laughs> Ruth. <laughs> um, and uh, there's a lot of people back in on the West Coast who couldn't make it here um, who I'm speaking on behalf of. So I just wanted to shout that out. Uh, California Transit by the numbers. It's a Pretty large economy, as we always like to tout, uh, but let's look at the transit. Uh, so we have um, official count of right now, because it keeps growing. The first thing we had to do at Cal ATP um, was to actually figure out where all the transit was, because there wasn't an official list of where public transit was. It was, we knew who we gave money to through different programs, but not across all those programs. And uh, it, you know that didn't include uh, programs that got uh, direct funding. So. Uh, we have a, a list in growing of actually where the public transit is, so we knew who we needed to, to reach out to and measure. Um, so at last count, we had 288 transit providers or unique organizations that were providing public transit, um, 615 actual services uh, from those. Um, and uh, I think I, I did a count. Um, they're not all fixed route services. In fact, 202 of those services are actually... Uh, have a demand responsive component, either in deviated fixed route um, or in purely um, purely on-demand services. So something to consider when we think about their eligibility for GTFS. Um, so there's been a lot of talk from the uh, from everybody here already about why data quality matters. Uh, so I'll just touch really briefly on this uh, from the from the state side or the um, and you know obviously it matters to riders. We want to get people out of their cars and onto more efficient um, and uh, friendly modes of modes of travel, um, and the, but it also matters because we need to figure out how to manage the system. So we, it doesn't just matter that the rider gets a good user experience um, on their phone. What we really care about is that they get a real good user experience in the real life, and um, and 
understanding where transit is is critical to providing that good user experience. Um, you can't improve what you can't measure. Um, and Eric Dashmali, who's sitting over here, has done some amazing work on providing a lot of feedback through the use of uh, GTFS real-time data um, to lots of agencies and to uh, various jurisdictions on what, what transit looks like um, when it's traveling through the world and how we could potentially um, how we could potentially improve it. And we actually have a funding program designed around that right now, um, which wouldn't have been possible without, without GTFS real time and using that data. And it also really matters for policy. So here, Eric again has mapped um, these uh, high quality transit areas, which is embedded in California state policy, um, but actually had never been mapped before because we didn't have the data all together in one place to map it. Again, we didn't even know where the transit services were in California. So having all that data together, knowing when they were actually, um, when we actually had high frequency transit service on the street during various times of day, um, we could actually for the first time map this, um, which is kind of crazy that that's been in California law for years, decades maybe, and now we actually can see that. So. Um, we're looking at GTFS data quality, not just from the rider perspective, but also um, the immediate rider perspective, but also how to deliver that good user experience overall um, in their day-to-day -day lives, um, which includes getting good transit on the street, having um, effective land use policy around that transit, um, et cetera. So the vision uh, for the part of CalITP that, that I, I'm a part of, the team I'm part of, is to get transit riders transit providers and policy makers the information they deserve. That's a shorthand vision. Um, and uh, yeah, so we are focused on that. Um, and this is what we're doing. So our theory of change is essentially we wanna be able to set the bar of what data quality is because um, there's a lot of different ways to measure quality and we figured we should set some sort of bar somewhere um, for what they, you know, to be able to define the data that we deserve. Um, we assess um, all of the transit agencies uh, within California compared to that bar, and then we try and figure out how to help them get there. Um, and so uh, I'm gonna talk about each of these in a little more, more detail, um, but you can see some of the activities that we do on each of these. So the, the bar setting is really underpinned by the GTFS standard itself, um, some higher level things called the mobility data interoperability principles, um, the best practices, and then we have our own transit data guidelines as well. Um, and the assessment uh, process, which Lori Merrill, um, <laughs> sitting next to Eric there, has been leading uh, along, has been, um, we have a data pipeline that evaluates uh, the GTFS data um, on an hourly basis for real time right now, and on a um, daily basis, I think, for the, the static. Um, to assess the data quality. Um, and then we have um, a lot of dashboards and things like that, um, which I'll go into in a minute. Um, and then we try and assist agencies. And I just want to underpin that um, agencies aren't cookie cutters. And, you know, we thought that we could provide, you know, a, a set of, sh Ruth is shaking her head because she also experienced a lot of this. <laughs> um, we it, we had to do a lot of listening and we did a, do a lot of rapid feedback and a lot of our, our work is about listening to what they need and being responsive to that. Um, so I just want to underpin that, that. So here's some things of what we heard um, and Ruth probably has a few more quotes that she could add and shout out as well from, from her time. Um, so I wish I could add more info to our GTFS but our vendor doesn't support it. That is one of the number one uh, things we get. Um, and there's, while there's amazing, um, there's, a, you know, vendors are doing their job the best that they can. And while there's um, a lot of amazing vendors that produce, you know, GTFS specifically who are here, Aaron, Ritesh will give you amazing GTFS. Um, there's a lot of vendors that just export GTFS um, as an as a off gas of their scheduling system or something else. So, um, you know, GTF, having all the fields for, for whatever fares isn't the top of their priority. Um, our GTFS data is late to get posted because we have to go back and forth between two to three vendors with each schedule change and they point the finger at each other when it doesn't validate. This is also really common. <laughs> um, and it is the case that we made um, to work on data standards for, for interchanging things um, uh, beyond GTFS. Um, and 
we have agencies that every time their schedule changes, they actually have to manually enter things uh, three times. Um, instead of double entry accounting, we have triple entry schedules. Um, and that was fine when their schedules changed once a year during COVID times, that was not fine. Like <laughs> it was really not fine. Um, and it took a really long time for people to get schedules out and people had to rethink their processes really quickly. Um, another thing here is I, I don't, I want to improve our GTFS data, but I don't know where to start. Um, and then we would love to spend development hours on more GTFS features, but we can only develop what we are contracted to deliver. This is what we hear from a lot of the vendors, and we totally understand that, um, that a lot of them aren't given the latitude to do feature development um, beyond what they're actually contracted to do. Unfortunately, we have this other issue floating out there on the right in California. I can't put it out an RFP for a product with requirements that don't exist. So I can't say I want a scheduling system that produces GTFS software that has Ferris V2 and does all of these other, or that will accommodate Ferris V2 or accommodate all of these other things if it doesn't exist. Um, and there's not a ton of scheduling software to choose from. And I'm not blaming them because nobody's paid them to, to do this. And so there's this chicken and egg problem here on the, on the vendor side. Um, and then we also hear from a lot of software developers that they're worried about investing development resources in something that is constantly evolving and isn't stable. And those um, developers who aren't immersed in the GTFS ecosystem are like, oh, GTFS is always changing. Of course, I am like, GTFS doesn't change quick enough. But they, <laughs> um, they, they have a development cycle, which is much more long term, and a release cycle, which is more on an annual maybe every five years basis on some of them, um, maybe some every decade, but um, uh, you know, they, they're constantly feeling like they're playing catch up and they're like, oh gosh, I can't believe I have to implement this other feature that you guys asked for. Um, so one of the things that we've been doing is trying to adopt a consistent agenda so that we all know uh, where we're going and what is expected. And one of the things underpinning that is the mobility data interoperability principles, which we'll, we have a session about um, later this morning, which I encourage you all to come to, um, which sort of lays out a plan for creating interoperability, including GTFS between these systems, and that that's a general expectation. Um, it's gonna be a general expectation for procurement um, moving forward uh, as far as we could, anything that we can touch at least. Um, some other things that we've heard. Um, our vendor says our data meets the GTFS spec. We all know the GTFS spec. Lots of data meets the GTFS spec. Doesn't mean it's accurate or reasonable. Um, and it also doesn't mean that it includes all the fields that our users expect. Another thing we hear is our marketing team wants all our customers to use our app. <laughs> that We get that a lot. Um, we're trying to dissuade people of that, um, but that's something that we hear a lot. Um, so they don't really value their public GTFS um, very much at all. Or I don't know how to translate what writers want into how to provide that data into GTFS. So they may be getting feedback from writers or wanting to do that, but they don't have the technical expertise to understand how to do that in their system um, because it's not necessarily their job to produce GTFS. Their job is to probably run buses or sometimes it's the general manager that's producing the GTFS. Um, so we get that a lot as well. Um, my agency doesn't have the money to invest in GTFS beyond what we're already doing. Um, and we get, we hear this a lot from, from people who want to invest in their GTFS, um, but they haven't been able to convince their managers or their executive directors, um, that it's something important to invest in, that their customers are actually looking at it. So usage data is actually something that's really important, um, point of feedback to be able to give them usage data request. Um, <laughs> it's hard to convince clients that they should spend more resources approving the data when it's already in Google. So. Sometimes when everybody corrects things, which is great, thank you for correcting all of our data, um, there's not motivation to actually fix it at the source. And there's not the resources to be able to go back and actually fix it. So we have that problem too. It's like Google accepts it. Why do we need to spend any more money on it? There are, our users are getting it just fine. Um, I don't really have time to understand what should be in our GTFS data, very common. Could you just point me to a resource so I can hand off those requirements to somebody else to take care of? Um, so having just like a package of like what you need, it's really important. Um, it's hard to justify spending more resources on our GTFS when it technically meets the specifications. I mean, Google seems to think our data is okay. That's sort of a repeat of the other one. <laughs> 
Uh, they're clearly not reading the reports that you're giving them, but they're seeing that it's in the map. So that's what they're, <laughs> that's what they really care about. And sometimes, uh, you know, agencies don't even know who has the login to the Google transit port. Many times agencies don't even know who has a login. They're like, Oh, I think that intern had the login, like who left three years ago. Um, so, um, I don't know how to tell my IT contractor how to post our data to make sure it's discoverable. The person who used to do it left two years ago. Another instance of their turnover is a constant issue, especially at the smaller transit providers um, and people who, who may, may have had the expertise or interest or done something um, at one point in time are often not there a year later, um, unfortunately. It's a big issue in our industry. So some of the things we're doing, um, we're specifying uh, what we all need to do to get the transit data we deserve. What we deserve is a lot, um, and it might take a lot to get there, um, but we kind of lay that out in what we call the California Transit Data Guidelines. Uh, they're formerly called the California Minimum GTFS Guidelines, um, written originally by Ruth. Um, <laughs> you can Google them and find them. Um, and they're really aspirational, um, but they are basically our best representation of what we think, uh, what we think riders and transit providers deserve um, and what we should expect of everybody. Some more things. My boss is motivated by beating my peer agencies. How are our peers doing? Um, our, but also, we don't see ourselves as an agency willing to take risks. We want to be in the middle of the pack. We hear that as a lot. Like, we don't want to be the first penguin in the water. Our vendor says our data is just fine. It passes their validator, another one of those. Or I don't know if something is wrong until somebody calls or tweets at us. Um, so they're not reading the reports that you're giving them clearly, but um, they just there's not a feedback loop to the right people. Um, we don't finalize our schedule until right before we operate it. There's no room for back and forth cleaning of our data. This happened a lot during COVID um, and it still happens a lot as people finalize union contracts and bidding and things like that. Um, we lose track of all the things that we need to get done to improve our GTFS, particularly longer systematic changes rather than incremental stop gaps. Um, and this is a big issue um, with the, the, those vendor things that we talked about of like interoperability between these systems and like the larger business processes that need to be changed, um, which take time to change um, and can get lost if we don't you know, keep track of them. We've been spending money on improving data. How can we tell it's worth it? I need to show my boss that all of this investment is worth it. So getting that feedback to them on, yay, good job, pat on the back. Um, or I'm losing things in translation between the issues that are reported and what I need to ask my vendor to fix the data. This is something that has come up a few times of like, so I see this validator warning, what do I do about it? Like, what, what do you think is actually wrong with my data? Um, so some of the things we're doing is, again, we're evaluating the data in our pipeline. Um, we're sort of specifying what we need to do to get all the transit data we deserve. Uh, we have these reports and dashboards that we're creating um, that agencies are have some meaningful access to. Uh, Eric is in charge of helping uh, format some reports that are going to them again. Sorry, Eric, that you're being embarrassed by that. Um, <laughs> and this is a map of our various processes at various levels that we go through. Um, and how we audit things. So the first thing is getting agencies on the map. We're down to just a handful of public agencies that aren't on the map um, and GTFS. Um, and we use, we have an air table that you know, helps us identify those. Um, and we do those on an ad hoc basis. We sort of uh, reach out to them. And then we have these data quality pipeline dashboards, um, which we look at daily to figure out if we have any catastrophic feed problems and that makes sure that we, uh, we're trying to help agencies uh, get make sure that tr people have access to their data and trip planners um, and we notify them every 48 to 150 hours I guess um, depending we don't we try to do it every 24 hours and they're like we know we know stop bugging us so like uh, we <laughs> wait a few days before before to see if things resolve uh, before bugging them um, we have monthly reporting that's put up on the websites that that Eric works on. Um, and so that's bringing attention to issues affecting the data um, that customers deserve and incentivizes action because we hope to rate that or show the agencies that are either you know in decline or showing them that you know that they're improving um, when they are actually improving um, and and show how they're doing related to their peers hopefully and then we have so that we don't lose track of those big systematic things we do an annual review process um, led by our wonderful data quality customer success team. Um, Olivia, and uh, they sort of 
communicate. Um, they do a big assessment for all of the, the California GTFS guidelines um, and work through uh, an action plan with the agencies. Um, really briefly, I know I'm going over. So um, some last things that we heard is just about when we reach out to them. Um, you can add wheelchair accessibility data to GTFS. I had no idea that would be such a value to our customers. And I um, want to stress the importance of ADA accessibility and trip planning. Um, that that's really critical, um, and we don't do a good job of that. And um, we need to because people who access transit that they think is accessible and all of a sudden it's not. That's a really horrible user experience, and it's not fair. Um, and it's illegal, actually, <laughs> like um, in the U.S. at least. Um, so, and many agencies aren't even aware that this is, this is a feature, so um, something to bring up. Um, we hear a lot of requests for, I don't understand, does this product work with this one? Does the scheduling software work with that? How do I get my CAD AVL to work with this uh, a predictor? Um, so we get a lot of requests uh, about that. Um, we tried to keep our data up to date, but the person who did it left, nobody else has been trained, so just like I need training on like, what is this GTFS, GTFS 101? Um, we get a lot of other questions about vendors, who else has this vendor, so that I can talk to them, see if they have that problem too. Um, or there are other buses that stop here but have different stop attributes. I wish I had known that. People are not even aware that they stop next to another agency that stops like down the street, so there's potential for consolidation. Um, I need somebody with technical expertise to sit on calls with my vendor. This is super common. Um, or I need somebody to be a thought partner on how to get this done. Um, and uh, one of the number one requests we get and the number one success, a lot of the success we have is really just being a thought partner with them and sitting down and being like, let's help you work through why this is happening. Um, and a lot of times at agencies, people working on GTFS are working on it alone and they don't have a team. Um, and even people at really large agencies, Amtrak, like don't necessarily have a lot of internal champions. And so finding those internal champions and sitting on meetings with them and their boss and their boss's boss every two weeks is what gets some of those things done. I didn't do anything special other than sit in meetings to get Amtrak to publish their GTFS, but yay, I'm glad it happened. And the internal champion uh, who got that done is, is really the person to, to um, champion in that. Um, another problem is there's not a lot of responses to procurement, so agencies don't have a lot of choices, um, especially the smaller agencies. And um, <laughs> There's a, a lot of agencies that are just really small. Um, so I'm the only full-time employee at my agency who isn't a bus driver. Sometimes they actually are the bus driver too. Um, help me figure out how to do this without spending much time on it. Um, and so that's a lot of agencies. We have a lot of agencies in California where they run one route. Um, and so they don't have, like GTFS is not on the forefront of their mind, even though they want to help, they want their customers to know where they're going. Um, so, you know, just listening. Uh, is the, the key to that and being responsive to their needs. Um, and there's a lot of stuff behind that, um, but it's all sort of responsive to that. And I'm way over time, so I'm not going to go over this wish list. Um, but thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Elizabeth. And thank you for the amazing work you're doing. Uh, do we have questions in the room? Yes, I see a hand raise. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name's Willem. I think I'm the token academic here. I'm the only one from a university. Um, and I can, I can sympathize and empathize because doing research with transit data is like yet another set of frustrations um, in dealing with bad data. But um, my question was maybe for Elizabeth and, and also for the consumers. Um, you mentioned, you know, so we heard from the consumers that the agencies are maybe putting out data that isn't super great and the agencies obviously don't have a whole lot of resources and there's a little bit of, of turning around and saying, well, the vendors are not necessarily giving us what we really need um, as well. And I know there's some great vendors in the room, but there's certainly a lot of vendors not in the room and a lot of public transit agencies not in the room. Um, they're not the one, the ones that are producing the bad data are probably not the ones that send people to a conference like this. And so um, I'm wondering if you had any thoughts about how to move people from that middle of the road, from that sort of standard practice into best practice and how to really in maybe either from a consumer point of view or from a vendor point of view, how to really like encourage that. Yeah, despite the fact that I said that we spend a lot of time on the phone with the agencies, a lot of the stuff we try and do is, is think about like what is that larger scale 
um, difference that we can make. Um, and I think that uh, one of the things that we're doing is just having agencies put the minimum guidelines and the mobility data interoperability principles in their procurements. Again, some agencies don't have the latitude to procure for things that don't already exist. Um, but we hope that by setting a clear direction for where we want the market to go, that those vendors will be able to prioritize those feature developments um, and those improvements. Um, and so, you know, I think the key is, and you know, we're, we talk with the vendors about this, and it's on their it's on their pipelines, and it's not that they're um, not interested; it's just not their core business, and it's it's viewed as something that's extra. And so, um, putting it in the core requirements for procurement um, is something that that we're definitely doing, um, and we hope that that goes a long way to to helping agencies at a larger scale as opposed to at a smaller scale, and then. Also, making sure that uh, figuring out ways, um, we have something called the Mobility Marketplace, um, where um, the California Mobility Marketplace, you can Google it, um, where we had a successful procurement for, uh, for payment, uh, contactless payment uh, components that you, you know, a kit of parts for doing contactless payment on your bus. And so we're looking at potentially doing that for for transit system parts that go together to then create GTFS. So I'll, um, so stay tuned on that. Um, and uh, we think that being able to leverage leverage the power of the state of California, um, we can um, we can have more incentives for vendors to to bid on things as opposed to one vendor in the Central Valley who runs two buses um, trying to get a good bid. Um, they're not going to be able to to get anybody to bid on it that also meets the, the current um, aspirational guidelines. So we have a question in the front. Hi, uh, Ritesh from IBI. Um, this is uh, maybe a slightly different question, which is, so there are four consumers on the, uh, on the dais. Um, all of you describe different ways of modifying data to correct it. Um, some things that stood out to me was fixing head signs. Uh, fixing stop locations. We do a lot of work with medium and large sized agencies and it's almost a, diff a slightly different perspective is uh, doing too much um, and doing things differently. So, um, you know, classic, uh, this trip planner showed a stop in a place where it doesn't exist. Well, you have some kind of process that applied some logic to move it, but that's not really where the stop is. Um, head signs, another thing. There is a reason why we did this. This is what you're showing. So uh, I know medium and large size agencies should know better and have better data, but how do you almost say, like, don't go too far? Um, it's a hard question because... Um, there's always going to be, when we do modification to the data, there's always going to be errors that come up on, on our side. Um, I think the way at least that we look at it is if we, and like, and if we can prove that overall it is better, um, then we think it, it is okay to do. And, but that's also something that we talk a lot with like our partner agencies is making sure that like the changes that we do make sense for them. And like when we do have big overall or big changes, like that's something we we will talk to partner agencies in advance and make sure they're okay with it and make sense. So it's like it's a constant feedback loop. Um, in addition to know what we know or what the data at least shows that is better. I can only add to that that um, the user eventually it's what guides us, right? The, their needs and. Uh, I can tell you about the stops, right? You're thinking, okay, a stop that is 15 meters, come on, they, they will see it. I have to tell you that if the 15 meters are not at the same curb, for example, but across the street, the, the, uh, more than 50% of the users do not understand what they need to do, they miss the bus, uh, for example. So sometimes the accuracy of even five meters can be a big difference. Um, and we do ask ourselves every time what is actually valuable for the user, right? So if it's less than five meters, by the way, we, we will not touch it, uh, in example. And also on, on our side, we always love um, to have a good connection with the agencies. 
there are thousands of agencies, so if none of them will be proactive, we don't have really the resources to be proactive with everyone, um, but we definitely encourage to contact us or we do the same if needed. Just, okay. I would just add, I think, you know, as a community, we didn't have a lot of sort of consistent guidance, in the, especially in the early days of the spec for, you know, how we should handle some of these fields. And it sort of allowed a lot of different approaches to proliferate. Um, and I think we're kind of in the hard position of trying to bring some consistency to that space after a decade of letting it sort of grow, let the garden grow and, and uh, seeing what happens. So uh, that's not going to be easy. Um, but I do think there is that opportunity to sort of try, you know, we've, we're doing the work of establishing those best practices and saying like, this is not just coming out of a vacuum. It's driven by a user need. Um, this is what we're, we're all sort of agreed that we'd like to see in the data and, and give that foundation of why we're asking for these things. Um, but it is going to be a struggle, I think, to kind of go back and get that done after the fact. Cool. And so I just wanted to add that also some of this data will get used in different contexts depending on where the, the, the producer of the data is planning to use it. So, for example, on the agency's own website, they, they might be that same field might also be getting displayed in a journey planner. It might also be getting used in on-street signage. So we have, for example, um, we'll see like a, a head sign which might incorporate the line number, but we don't really want to put that information like that into a journey planner. And in using the example of uh, Transport for West Midlands in the UK, some of their head sign data is getting displayed in on-street signage. So then they need to make sure that that's less than 19 characters. So there's a bit of a challenge there in sort of tailoring how we, how we might um, adjust some of that depending on the, the context that data is going to be used. Anthony from Google, um, question for public transit and maybe Cal ITP would be, um, what's the regulatory mechanism that's used to um, ensure that those GBFS feeds are open in some cities but not open in other cities? Um, like it, it is actually in the RFPs or uh, in, in the requirements to be able to operate in a city. Usually, they, they, they it is in the requirements to just be able to operate in a city. You need to also provide the GBFS. So it's pretty straightforward legislation of you need to make it open. And that's why some um, it's it's not as bad now than it was in the past. But in the past, in, in the beginning of where that that trend was starting to happen, we would see very bad or like basically scrap GBS feed, GBFS feed that would just be put out there just to check a box, even if it wasn't usable in practice. Um, now it's better because it, it's more it's more widespread. I actually don't know the answer to that. Do, do any Californians know the answer to that? <laughs> no. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, I think I am the other elephant um, uh, working the equity space. And question is for um, Elizabeth. Um, one of the things that um, I am curious to know. What level of, I guess, support or handholding, uh, knowing the difference between urban versus rural, um, does the agency provide for those um, communities that are not as developed with their transit system in the state of California? Great question. Um, so. We um, we try and price, provide support who to anybody who will listen <laughs> to us is really 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 that. Um, but in terms of um, who we have the direct more direct relationship with, um, we actually have actual funding relationships with um, through the 57, 5310 and fifty three eleven. Um, funding mechanisms which go through the state as opposed to the 5307s which go directly to the larger agencies. So we have a much more direct funding relationship with all the small and rural agencies and also the inter-regional inter agencies that serve them. So we have uh, much more touch points with them just through the fact that they kind of have to listen to us and have to have those touch points um, and we're happy to have them and provide that assistance. Um, I would say that we also try and provide assistance to those who need it and try and not try and provide extra assistance to those who don't need it because we have limited resources. So, you know, in the Bay Area, they have a great team at the, the 511 team at MTC with NASAR and supported by Interline. And they're, they're taking care of GTFS. Like, we don't need to worry about them. Um, NASAR is reaching out to all of them and making sure that they're constantly improving things. Um, so we just don't worry about them. And LA Metro, 
Like we're, we help them help themselves sometimes and we have relationships with them. Um, but you know, they're pretty self-sufficient and we, we help them be there and, you know, help the internal champions there when we need to, but we're not, um, we're not there, you know, spending the majority of our time on that. We're spending the majority of our time on the agencies that, that have no idea where to start and, uh, or where they're going. Um, and that's where we can provide the most value at. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, everyone. I know there are still a lot of questions, but I do not want to steal away from the coffee break and the amazing discussion that you will all have to our speakers. So before they leave the stage, I would like to ask you to applause one more time our speakers. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for listening in. The, all these sessions afterwards will be recorded and shared with you. And don't miss any of our next session at 11. Thank you.